Okay. Okay. These days, Malcolm in the Middle is remembered more for giving us Walter White than any of its actual accomplishments. How does a sitcom go from being one of the highest rated shows on air to being rarely spoken about? What's even stranger is the fact that Malcolm in the Middle quietly reinvented the sitcom and no one realized it. It's said that success has many parents and failure only one. Well, in the case of Malcolm in the Middle, it would be hard to argue that anyone other than screenwriter Linwood Boomer was the authorial voice behind the show's creative heights. Believe it or not, Linwood got a start not as a writer, but as an actor. After playing Adam Kendall on Little House on the Prairie for close to four seasons, he segued into a very lucrative career behind the camera. He put his mind to writing, working on shows like Night Court, Third Rock from the Sun, and the American version of the British cult classic Red Dwarf. During his time as a staff writer, Boomer would regale his fellow writer's room residents with stories about his childhood, being the second youngest of four brothers, his odd couple parents, and the bizarre hijinks his family unit regularly engaged in. These stories took on such a life of their own that they developed something of an urban legend status in the back alleys of Tinseltown. Development executives would often take meetings with him just to attempt to learn if the stories they had heard secondhand were true. Eventually, this led to an official sit-down with his representation. His manager and agent implored him to write a pilot based on his family. He was reluctant initially, but was eventually won over by a simple sentence his agent said, I know I can sell this. After a prolonged period of writing, pitching, and attempting to get production companies on board, they did just that. They sold it to Fox. The pilot would eventually be produced and scheduled for release in a time slot directly in between Fox's two top shows, The Simpsons and X-Files. The show was quickly defined by its immense level of heart and director Todd Holland's keen visual sensibility. Malcolm in the Middle premiered in the year 2000. And despite a healthy portion of fisheye lenses and whip pans, Malcolm in the Middle was decidedly not your standard fare. The common creative rubric of the day was that sitcoms were shot with three cameras, on a stage, and always utilizing a laugh track. Malcolm in the Middle eschewed all of that in favor of a single camera cinematic execution. The show was simultaneously rooted in the era it was produced in and seemingly timeless. It had a cinematic style all its own. It had a bigger, more dynamic visual palette which, when combined with Boomer's brilliant characterization and structure, made it something created completely from whole cloth. Additionally, the show featured a narrative mechanic where Malcolm, played by the young Frankie Muniz, would break the fourth wall, turn to the camera, and talk directly to the audience. How can they do that? He's in a wheelchair. Again, this was not something that was happening on TV in the year 2000. What Deadpool is to the superhero, Malcolm was to the sitcom, deconstructing it and being a new boundary-pushing entry into the genre simultaneously. Additionally, the single camera aesthetic helped set Malcolm in the Middle apart from much of what was being broadcast on network TV at the time. The show routinely used the single camera to set up visual sight gags humorous scenarios that only worked because of the fixed point of view. Take for example in the pilot, when Lois is shaving House body at the breakfast table. Everything is blocked perfectly to constantly milk the most humor out of the scene possible. This style of comedy would not have been doable in a traditional three-camera setup. No, it would have literally been impossible to block these visual side gags while framing for three individual setups. In many ways, Todd Holland, who was well known for his film The Wizard and directing episodes of Twin Peaks, was the secret ingredient of the show. He was the reason the show consistently felt as though it was pushing new limits. While Boomer's scripts were technically and traditionally avant-garde, Holland was the person who breathed life into the show. He made things that seemed as though they would be over the top feel more grounded, and he would find the comedy in the blocking of a serious scene. In other words, Holland's single camera point of view was the logical extension to the show's idiosyncratic authorial voice. The other aspect of the show that seems like standard sitcom fare, but when examined closer is completely unique, is the very specific family dynamic on display. Jane Kaczmarek played Lois, the matriarch of the family, and typically half-hour comedies gave all the big laughs and the domineering narrative presence to the fathers, Archie Bunker, Al Bundy, or George Jefferson. Well, Malcolm in the Middle handed that role squarely to Kaczmarek's Lois. She was the head of the family, no questions. She was both a stern authoritative figure and a loving mother all in the same time which paired perfectly with Brian Cranston's Hal, who was a sweet, quiet, brainy child trapped in the body of a 40-year-old man. These dynamics took what could have been a run-of-the-mill show and propelled it into something completely different. However, the aspect of the show that truly set it apart was that it was constantly willing to reinvent itself. Yes, it premiered as the second most watched debut in the history of Fox, but we all know how quickly stars fall and rise in Hollywood. 
By the time season two got rolling, Todd Holland and Linwood Boomer were eager to push into new territory, and they did. The episode titled Bowling, the 20th episode of the second season, was perhaps one of the most artistically adventurous episodes to ever air on a network show. The premise of the episode is that the boys are going to be taken bowling by their parents. However, this conventional setup quickly escalates into the avant-garde where we split into two alternative timelines, one where Hal takes the boys and one where Lois takes them. We then see split-screen adventures of how the two parents have radically different parenting styles. Hal has a more lackadaisical, laid-back approach to rearing his offspring, while Lois is controlling and aggressive. And this episode is as technically brilliant as it is shocking that they actually pulled it off on a mainstream network show. It's one thing for Rick and Morty to do a split-screen parallel timeline episode on Adult Swim in 2019. It's another when it's on Fox nearly 20 years ago. Not only did Malcolm in the Middle reinvent what we thought sitcoms could be, it kept reinventing it. The show continued to push the boundary of what was accepted on network TV, from episodes like Season 7's Lois Strikes Back, which features Lois seeking revenge on a group of teenage girls, to Season 4's If Boys Were Girls, which sees Lois daydreaming about a family filled with well-mannered young girls. Malcolm in the Middle consistently pushed and pulled at what audience expectations of a 30-minute comedy should be. That's to say nothing of the fact that the structure of the show always evolved. Initially, pitched as a show where the child protagonist really is the central character, Malcolm in the Middle rapidly evolved into a full ensemble piece. The entire cast, both parents and children, were vital to the show's growth and evolution, which is expanded on by how quickly it introduced characters like Stevie, the black asthmatic wheelchair-bound best friend of Malcolm, Commandant Spangler, and Craig, Lois's lovesick co-worker, or even Francis, the eldest brother of the family who is constantly removed from the family's day-to-day -day struggles, but still feels like a vital part of the show's narrative landscape. The conventional wisdom of sitcoms is that you shouldn't introduce new reoccurring characters into the show's run because it could upset the equilibrium of the established characters. This was not something that Boomer and Holland ever seemed concerned with at all. They consistently threw monkey wrench after monkey wrench into the show, almost as if getting themselves out of the narrative corners was half the fun. Overall, Malcolm in the Middle is not looked back on as being a high watermark in the early 2000s sitcom world, but it should be. It has the heart, inventiveness, and charisma of any of the shows that are consistently being heralded as boundary pushing, but with the added fact that it actually did push boundaries. The deeply flawed characters, the inventive cinematography, the undeniably unique authorial voice captured the hearts and minds of the viewers across the globe. It's almost unthinkable that a show this creatively unique and specific was able to achieve the heights that it actually did. And it's doubly bizarre how it has receded into the shadows. If nothing else, the show's lack of laugh track paved the way for Scrubs, Arrested Development, and 30 Rock, plain and simple. Which is why we should all revisit the shining achievement of comedy filmmaking. Malcolm in the Middle, whether anyone wants to admit it or not, reinvented the sitcom. And well, that's all for Nerdstalgic. Let us know in the comments what you think, and as always, please like and subscribe for more Nerdstalgic videos.